it's just so. Until I got it clear, it's like a good moment. Uh huh. You go out to Texas Steelers. Yeah. Oh. I'll do that right after the minutes. Okay. So I can go and do it out of the way. This regular meeting of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen will come to order. I'll ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. <clears throat> Everybody all right over on that corner over there? You all right? Her little racket over there. All right. Uh, we have two public hearings on the agenda. The first one deals with uh, Title 10 of uh, our municipal code, which is entitled Animal Control, and it would amend Chapter 2 entitled Dogs and Cats. Is there anyone in our audience who would like to make a statement uh, with regard to that proposed change? Hearing none, we move to number two, which is in regard to uh, changes in our ordinance that would enable us to adopt the 2006 International Energy Conservation Code. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to make a statement on that subject? Hearing none, I declare the public hearings both having been concluded. We move now to the approval of the minutes of the last meeting, of which was February the 21st. Is there a motion? So move. And a second? Second. Second. All right, any discussion? If you would favor the approval of the minutes, Please say aye. 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 Oppose no. So ordered. Mr. Hubbard, you had a statement you wanted to make. I'll let you go now before the legislative portion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the request of the board in December, they requested that we bring back an overview of the National League of Cities meeting, which we attended last week. And for those who may not know, the National League of City is an organization about 19,000 cities across America with about 5,000 members. And the function of the, of the membership is to influence our federal leaders about the needs of our local government. Now within this National League of Cities, there are seven different committees that they use to influence the federal leaders with. First is the Community and Economic Development Committee, which I'm part of it, the en Energy, Environment, and National Resource Committee, Finance Administration, and Intergovernment Relations, Human Development, Informational Technology and Communications, Public Safety and Crime Prevention, and Transportation Infrastructure. So these are the committees that break down the whole National League of Cities uh, uh, organization. Each committee has two lobbyists, which are lawyers, who I advocate daily to the Senate and the Congress to let them know exactly our specific needs. In this particular meeting, we were sort of dissatisfied with, and I'm going to use the mean spiritness of federal elected officials. It's very unfortunate that your federal officials, some of them from Tennessee, are part of that mean spirit. They want to cut back the Community Development Block Grant, and that's the grant that, that covers all the infrastructures of America. They want to repel, as you know, the, 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 the health initiative. They want to cut back on education and, uh, and a few other things that affect the local government. So from a general consensus of the National League of Cities, we rather hold a more moderate position. 
where concessions are given on both sides are not just totally annihilating the city. My main function, I'm part of the steering committee, which compiles of 50 different people from each state in America. And some of our potential priorities that we dealt with was revision of federal programs, including the Community Development Block Grant. And one of the reasons we were standing on this because we wanted, want the long-term impact not to be so devastating that we can't receive, especially the small cities, which will receive the rural block grants, where the major cities got the overall community block grants. Then another one was we wanted joint action with the Fair Committee on Community Bank Capitalization and Commercial Assets to Credit. So we're dealing with that too. We have some very astute leaders, local effective leaders in America. And we come around and we, 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 we American, American give you some, some, some highlights on this. Good ideas are, are brainstorms and collaboration is used and, and great things come out of that. Then another thing we wanted to do was reform the federal housing finance policy. And today, if you heard, there was more money that was put in to develop fair housing, okay? And we also have an advocate committee, which also backs up the steering committees, but they're not as effective as the steering committee. Now, me individually, let me get this out of the way to show you the makeup of the ribbons. Springfield is a member of the National League of Cities, so that's the first ribbon. The second ribbon, Springfield is a member of the State League. Now the State League is responsible for submitting who they want from the state to represent the different seven committees. So I'm the only one that's on the steering committee from the state of Tennessee at the wishes of the state municipal league. This one is the National Black Caucus of local elected officials, and, and they have about seven different subgroups within the, the National League of Cities. These are the list of leadership attainment, and I was a second diamond recipient about five years ago. Right now, I'm considered a diamond ambassador, and the function of the diamond ambassador is to teach and train other municipal leaders about municipal government. And so it was very effective. You're well represented. You get nuggets. Like I said, you get collaboration from there and then you can come back really and to help the city grow. So the pleasure of the, of the board, I feel that me and the mayor represented you quite well. And to the cities of Springfield, we thank you because your tax dollars wasn't wasted. Yeah. That's a good summary. Uh, <clears throat> one of the more critical uh, bills that was being discussed in the Senate while we were there had to, was the, the fact that the highway bill, the transportation bill was stalled and there was a lot of, that a whole lot of projects, yes, that, including some that would directly affect <clears throat> us, are in that. And uh, it's very critical. Uh, heard some testimony in the, in the Senate on that uh, while we were, while I was there. and. Uh, uh, some good summaries of what of, of an analysis really on the part of uh, it was a columnist from New York Times that you might read from time to time by the name of David Brooks, mm -hmm. who's a fairly young columnist who is has a conservative writer too for the New York Times, so they do balance a few things. And uh, he his analysis of the log jam in Washington and the things that need to be done to try to get some things moving and get us back on the right track was very very revealing, and I grateful to be able to attend. All right, we move now to the legislative portion of the agenda. <coughs> the agenda 2.1 uh, is a second reading uh, in regard to Ordinance 12-01. We've obviously discussed this one time already. It is ready now for second reading. Is there a motion that be considered? So moved. And is there a second? Second. All right, any questions or comments on this tonight? Yes. Ms. Nutter, you want to go first and I'll go second. Okay. Um, did everybody understand uh, the option you have on this? When I presented this the first time, I was a little conservative about uh, how the animals were to be uh, transported. Uh, we were very conservative in stating that if you were 
transporting an animal, it also had to be on the leash if the dog was not in the in the cab. Um, talk to um, Jody Baltz, the city administrator of Tullahoma, and Teresa Holt, who is the animal control supervisor for the city of Tullahoma, from which that section of the ordinance, that second sentence is based. And uh, they have it in their ordinance that if the dog is not vicious and the dog's in the cab or in the back of the vehicle or on the running board, uh, the bed of the vehicle or the running board, that it's considered on the owner's property. And uh, they felt that uh, it was pretty effective, that it gave the uh, people who were transporting their dogs or parking somewhere and, and having to leave the dogs for a while, that that gave them an option to do so without violating the leash law. So uh, I leave that uh, as an option. If you want to avail yourself of that option, then what you would have to do is uh, I have put in the, uh, an amended version, which is the last page in which you would amend the existing uh, Exhibit A, 10-203 uh, to add a uh, new sentence, replacing the last, the second sentence, and that would read as follows. A dog not classified as vicious that is upon the running board or in the bed of a truck or is enclosed within the cab of a vehicle shall be considered on the premises of the owner. And as long as an animal is on the premises of an owner, they don't have to be leashed. So that's the right. that's the significance of that input. Uh, Mr. Ellis? I, I move that we approve this amendment to the ordinance. Is there a second to Mr. Ellis's amendment? Second. All right. Now discussion on the amendment. The, the, the comment was I'm glad that you, you revised it because I got several calls that, you know, to the fact, you know, that it's ridiculous tie a dog down, you know, in the back of a truck. And then there was another suggestion that we consider, which I fully understand that too, is to have a, uh, a exercise park for animals. And, since we, have, and since we have a lot of land, and I'm gonna throw this on out, and Recreation Direct don't look at me, but you know, that big old hill out there at Travis Prize Park, now that can be a good doggy exercise here. We've got plenty of land up there. That's all. Other comments on this issue? Is it permissible to amend an amendment before we vote? <laughs> Mr. Balfour. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think you can, then, but you have to vote on the second amendment first before, okay. before you get to the, the amendment that's under consideration now. <laughs> All right. You want to propose a second? Uh, yes, I would like to, to amend the amended version to uh, include cats, not to run at large either. Uh, basically where the language says dogs not to run at large or dogs add are cats to control, add cats to it. All right, you've heard Mr. Shoemaker's amendment on the amendment. Uh, and, and Is and there I'll a second? second? Yeah, I'll second. Seconded by Alderman Mason. There's a question on that comment. All right. I think we're getting a little, little too persnickety about the cat situation. You know, I, I don't see where the cats would be too offensive. That's well, a long to come. I would hardly disagree but, with that. Well, yeah, that's, that's I do too. I'm tired of sitting on my motorcycle and on my vehicle and all that. I don't have cats and I don't want to. All right. right. Cat, cats, do, cats proliferate dynamically. Uh, they displace our, our indigenous population at an alarming rate is happening in states all over the country. Um, and as Mr. Mason said, I have yet anybody to call and, and complain because the dog has left tracks across the roof of their car. So, you know, just my opinion. But cats are also to helpful into eliminating some of the major pests such as the snakes and the rats and well, the other let's, unwanted let's things. Out of so, I'll, I'll take snakes so, over so they help cats. Eliminate them on their own premises. All right. On the floor, most recently, is an <laughs> amendment which adds cats to the other proposed amendment. If you would, would favor Mr. Shoemaker's amendment on cats, you will vote aye when your name is called. If you're opposed to it, you'll vote no. Ms. Watson, voting on, go, voting on the second amendment now. Ellis? No. Hubbard? No. Shoemaker? Aye. Carneal? No. 
Mason. Aye. Two times. Can, can you do it? Are you voting for one of the two that's out tonight? <laughs> nice try. Fail three to two. All right, we're back on uh, the other amendment, the Dallas's amendment, which takes care of where and where dogs can be with regard to uh, pickup trucks, etc. Yeah, Mayor, it essentially replaces the second sentence in in the first uh, reading right. with a new second sentence. Okay, for me with that. All right, any discussion now on Mr. Ellis' amendment on where dogs can be allowed on vehicles when they're being transported? Hearing none, if you're in favor of that amendment, amendment, vote aye when your name is called. If you oppose, vote no. Connie? Carneal? Aye. Mason? Aye. Hubbard? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Pass five to zero. All right. Okay, now we're back on the main motion, which is up for a second reading. Any further discussion on that? Hearing none, please call the roll. Carneal? Aye. Hubbard? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Mason? Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. All right, 2.2 .2 is the ordinance that we had a public hearing for just a moment ago with regard to the adoption of the 2006 International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, is there a motion that be considered? So moved. A second? Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Carneal? Aye. Shoemaker? No. Mason? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Hubbard? Aye. Pass four to one. All right, ordinance 12-03 is a first reading. This would rezone properties at 1014 and 1020 Bradley Drive, lots seven and eight of the Springfield Business Park from RI, Restricted Industrial, to MRO, Multiple Residential and Office. Uh, Ms. Watson will read that ordinance. Ordinance 12-03, an ordinance rezoning Bruce Head and John Thomas properties at 1014 and 1020 Bradley Drive, lots 7 and 8 of Springfield Business Park from RI Restricted Industrial to MRO, Multiple Residential and Office, whereas Bruce Head and John Thomas have requested that properties they own at 1014 and 1020 Bradley Drive, lots 7 and 8 in Springfield Business Park, be rezoned from RI, restricted industrial to MRO, multiple residential and office. And whereas the Springfield Planning Commission reviewed the request at its March 1, 2012 meeting and recommends that the property be rezoned from RI to MRO. Now therefore be it ordained by the Board of Mayor and Alderman of Springfield, Tennessee as follows. Section one, lots seven and eight in Springfield Business Park as described in exhibit A attached are hereby rezoned from RI restricted industrial to MRO multiple residential and office. Section two, all ordinances, resolutions, and policies in conflict herewith are hereby rescinded to the extent of the conflict only. All right, you've heard the reading of this proposed ordinance. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman and, and that's going to be responsible for this is, is considering a bedding practice station, something we don't have, which will help the city a putting course and other family oriented type of, uh, of activities. Okay. So we definitely need that. So you gave us a pretty good uh, outline. Any other comments? Is this across the street from the fire, fire department? The down, new one. Down the street. Further from down it until the end. <clears throat> Wonder how uh, lots. I mean, I, I know the lot numbers are 10, 14, and 10, 20, but there are lots seven and eight. Now, I wonder how they got those numbers. Look like Mr. Oh, James. They, looked like the numbers would have been together. Well, the lot seven and eight refer to the lots as they were numbered in the plat. The other numbers are the way they were numbered on the tax road. There was a difference in the way they were. The tax roll shows a different numbering system than the plat did. They're the same lots, and I used the, ta the tax roll numbers 
the Robertson County tax maps to describe the property, which is more appropriate to locate it than are the lot numbers. If that clears anything up. Thank you, Mr. James. Anything further before we vote? Hearing nothing, I'll ask that the roll will be called. Hubbard? Aye. Carneal? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Mason? Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. We move now to the top of the next page, item 2.4, and this is in regard to ordinance 12-04. It's also a first reading. It has to do with the annual schedule of fees and charges uh, for the Legacy Golf Course, rescinding the previous ordinance, which was 08-31, and substitutes a new schedule of fees, etc. Ms. Watson will read this, please. Ordinance 12-04, an ordinance amending the schedule of fees and charges for play at the Legacy Golf Course by rescinding Ordinance 08-31 in, in its entirety and substituting a new schedule of fees attached hereto as Exhibit A. Whereas Article 4, Section 13 of the Charter of the City of Springfield requires that the fixing of fees and charges be accomplished through legislative action, which must be exercised by ordinance. And whereas a schedule of fees and charges for play at the Legacy Golf Course was approved by the Board of Mayor and Alderman through adoption of Ordinance 08-31. And whereas the Board of Mayor and Alderman desires to amend the schedule of fees for the Legacy Golf Course at the recommendation of Billy Casper Golf Management. Now therefore be it ordained by the Board of Mayor and Alderman of Springfield, Tennessee as follows. Section 1, the schedule of fees for play at the Legacy Golf Course is hereby amended by rescinding Ordinance 08-31 in its entirety and substituting a new schedule of fees to read as set forth in Exhibit A attached. Section 2, the schedule of fees for the Legacy Golf Course as set forth in Exhibit A attached <coughs> shall become effective on May 1, 2012. Section 3, all ordinances, resolutions, and policies in conflict herewith are hereby rescinded to the extent of a conflict only. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay. All right. Any comment on this proposal? Mr. Nutty. Mayor, the uh, only thing that this uh, ordinance does is it changes the 18-hole uh, cart fee uh, by $1, increases it by $1 and increases the nine hole cart fee to 50 cents. The uh, base rates have been in effect since 2009. The schedule of fees uh, attached to my memorandum uh, labeled uh, 2011 is really the fees that have been in since 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012 for comparison is listed uh, side by side. And then the schedule to the ordinance simply uh, outlines the new fees with uh, the dollar added for 18 whole cart and 50 cents for nine whole cart. Other than that, the fee schedule has not changed. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any comment now from anyone else? <coughs> Please call the roll. Mason. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Carneal. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Pass five to zero. Of course, I think those who watch our meetings regularly know that we have replaced all of the uh, golf carts, new carts. Hopefully that pr the problem we had earlier is now being been resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair, busy up on the court. Time. 2.5 is uh, proposed action on resolution 12-05, which declares certain property as being surplus and authorizes the, the disposal of such property. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Please call the roll. Carneal. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. Items 2.67 and 8 are all re are individual resolutions dealing with capital outlay notes that uh, uh, are being proposed. Mr. We'll get a motion on this first one, Resolution 12-06. Is there a so motion on it? Second. All right. Well, Mr. Nutting is going to comment now on all three resolutions as we take up the first one.
So everybody uh, have their copy. What I want to do is uh, brief you on the amounts for each of these um, Kepler Outlay notes. The first one is for a uh, general fund note for four years. If you notice the amount in the first column all the way down, that's the amount that was originally budgeted. The second column is what I, well, it should be. I, I think I've made a, I didn't change a few of these numbers here, but really the second, the third list actual is the actual cost that we paid for those items or that we believe we will pay for those items. Um, the CDBG grant, of course, we did not get that grant, so there's no reason to borrow the money. So we took that out. The parking lot for golf, uh, which is in the general fund tenure note, if you notice, that was $56,000. We changed that to buy equipment for the park for the uh, golf course, which uh, is itemized as the rotary mower, the blower, and the aeration machine and then with the remaining money left over to seal the parking lot. And so that was taken, that money on the golf course was taken out of a 10-year note, uh, which was to buy equipment, which is not going to, well, will maybe last 10 years, maybe less than 10 years, which reduced the 10-year uh, note to six, $680,000 rather than 736. Uh, with the uh, 47 taken out, uh, we're still just a few thousand dollars more than we originally budgeted. Primary reason for that is we uh, had a utility vehicle for parks that broke down that is quite critical for maintaining the greenway and the fields. And so we decided to add that to the note uh, because it wasn't originally budgeted. And uh, another issue that, uh, a couple issues tonight, you're gonna be asked to reconsider uh, the snow plow, of course, we didn't. We had a very mild winter this year, and uh, Alan is requesting that we reduce that amount of ten thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars and purchase a mower instead, which is more critical to keeping the right of ways uh, mowed. And it looks like we're going to have a longer summer and spring than planned. And I think I've covered, well, one other thing. We had a uh, security system for City Hall was $15,100 on the four-year note. Um, we did have to replace a bunch of ceiling tiles in City Hall related to the roof replacement. So we're going to spend uh, 5137 on the security system and $9,963 for the improvements to City Hall. And then uh, when you get down to, so the 10-year note is for one thing, that's for street paving, $680,000. Uh, the last note really combines, it's one note, but it's for water and sewer. It was originally going to be four years. We changed it to five. Uh, we're having a bit of a uh, cash flow problem with regard to uh, depreciation. And so rather than deplete that fund by paying cash, uh, we thought it would be best. The capacitor bank was very expensive. So it wound up being $381,462, and we felt rather than paying that all in cash in one year, it would be better to pay that amount over a five-year period. So the water operating fund amount increased from $200,000 to $485,066, and the wastewater operating fund, uh, all the things that were originally budgeted for payment under a uh, note are budgeted. And uh, that turned out to be 150604 uh, So those two amounts will be combined in the five-year note for water wastewater. Also, you notice that the track vac for the water plant, uh, we wound up uh, paying most of that last year, and it wasn't anywhere near $95,000. So we took the $95,000 to help uh, reduce the impact of the capacitor bank. All right. Thank you for that analysis. Are there questions or comments on this? Hearing none, I'll ask. And, and Mayor, I would like to um, hand this four-year note out if, because it's been revised this afternoon. It reflects what you have on your sheet. But I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to hand this out to you earlier. If you'll just take your the one in your packet and substitute this one, you see it's reduced slightly. In accordance with what you just with what outlined. I just what I just right. given you from uh, two hundred thirty-two thousand seven ninety-eight 
to two hundred twenty nine thousand six sixty three. All right. What you're being asked to consider at this point is resolution twelve dash oh six, the four year uh, note. If you favor this this resolution, you'll vote aye when your name is called. If you oppose, vote no. Carneal. Aye. Mason. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Pass five to zero. All right. Now we have resolution twelve dash oh seven. This is the ten year note. Uh, $680,000. Is there a motion? So moved. And second. 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 Discussion now. Please call the roll. Ellis. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Carneal. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass by to zero. Okay. And now <clears throat> resolution 12-08. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. second. Duly seconded. Any questions, comments on this resolution? And this is the five year resolution. Please call the roll. Carnell. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Mason. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. 3.1 under administrative is the monthly consideration of the, the wholesale fuel cost adjustment which TVA uh, does every month. This month, uh, Mr. Gardner tells me it's going up a little bit. How much? 3%. 3%, okay. And Mr. it's been a while since I asked you this. What is the percentage of every dollar that we collect for, for, from our electric customers that is paid to TVA? What's the percentage? Uh, it's gotten a little better right now. It's around 85%. 85% of every dollar they pay us goes to TBA, and we operate on the remaining 15 for us. Okay. All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Comments? Complaints? Call TBA. See you, citizens. <laughs> Mr. Ellis, quiet over there. All right, hearing nothing, <clears throat> uh, I'll ask the roll be called. Hubbard? Aye. Carneal? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Mason? Aye. Pass five to zero. 3.2 is similar action with regard to the gas department and their rates. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Second. All right, uh, Mr. Hall? How much money? Which direction? Let's go. Uh, less than 1%. Less than 1%. Okay. All right. Any comments on this? Please call the roll. Mason? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Carneal? Aye. Hubbard? Aye. Pass five to zero. All right, 3.3 .3 is to discuss and possibly take action on compensation for easements needed for phase 2B of the water line construction. Is that out? 431 South? Okay. All right, is there a motion this be considered? So moved. And a second? Second. All right. Now you have questions on this. Mr. Uh, the Masters, do you want to come to the podium and just outline this, please? These are the last three easements that we were needing, but well, besides the Davenport easement that we took to court. And actually, we went to court to get them. The Davenport's were agreeable, but because of the time it take to get the easement signed, we went ahead and got a court order. Ms. Doris owns two properties, and she and her son own the third property. Uh, they were very kind enough to give us the right of entry while the easement prices were negotiated. I had come up with one price using the standard method that I do. Their attorney suggested another. Uh, our attorney, Jim Balthrop, opted to split the difference and propose that back to them, and they accepted. Right. Any questions? Have you already started? Uh, you hadn't already started laying the pipe yet, have you? Oh my goodness, we're, we're probably 80% done. 80%. I thought that's what was going on. Yes. Are we still moving to the east side of the road? We're there. the west side? We're on the east side. Yeah. Every bit's on the east side of the road. Okay. okay. All right, any other questions while well, Mr. LeMaster's the water, <coughs> wastewater director? Yes, yes, sir. Asked what did you mention? You mentioned Mr. Davenport. Yes. And I know that was the point. Did he accept? I mean, has that been settled? Yes, it has been settled. 
we we had a, a an offer to them they thought it was not nearly enough i hired carol croft and associates to do an appraisal of those two pieces of property which she did that was offered to them and they did accept of course we already had the condemnation in, in process and because of the time it would take there's a brother who is one of them who lives here he has a, a cousin who lives in old hickory and a cousin that lives in georgia it would have taken probably several weeks to get that document to go from one to the other to the other to get their signatures uh, notarized so Jim suggested that we go ahead and go to the court, had the court date for Thursday of last week or week before last, uh, tell them that there's an agreement, but because of the time constraints, we want to go ahead and get a court order to get the easement and the, and the court agreed. Okay. Any questions of you, Mr. Lamaster? Thank you, Roger. All right, you've heard the proposal. Uh, if you favor the, the settlement of, with regard to these easements, you'll vote aye. If you oppose, vote no. Carnell? Aye. Hubbard? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Ellis? Aye. Mason? Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. <laughs> Item 3.4 is to discuss and possibly take action on an offer by Hale and Cotton Tobacco to donate the company's warehouse building that is on uh, uh, Willow Street, I guess. Uh, next to the adjacent to the Springfield Police Department and is there a motion there that we consider this? So moved. And a second. <clears throat> second. Second. All, All right. right. Mr. Nutting, you want to explain that? Well, I think everybody's had a chance to uh, read the uh, offer. Uh, very generous on the part of Hale and Cotton. You'll notice the conditions that they wanted to make the donation. They would like to uh, transfer the deed by June 30th. The point of having the building, we really don't have a, a need for the building other than the fact it's really important and the fact that if we do have the building in our possession, then we do have an area to expand, expand the police department that's in our control. And uh, another good thing about the building is it's very structurally sound. It's an old building, but it has a lot of brick, a lot of uh, timber in there that could be uh, sold as part of the demolition process. So really, if we accept uh, this generous offer, uh, offer from uh, Helen Cotton, we'll just basically be holding the building. Now, I think the building had a recent new roof on it. Did you hear that, <coughs> Chief? I think that's what I heard. Uh, I don't think we, we haven't been up to actually look at it. But if we should have a bad storm or something that should happen to the building, of course, in our ownership, <coughs> then we'd have to make a decision whether it was worth it to repair it or just demolish it at that time. So that's the only real exposure that you have on it. Uh, you could use it for parking. It's got a lower ramp on the Hill Street side. And if you just filled it up with a not too terrible, terribly large amount of gravel, uh, you could use it for parking on the lower floor. So if we wanted to park uh, some of our vehicles out of the weather, we could do that. Stretches from Willow to here. It's it goes all the way from between the, the whole length of the block along 9th Avenue. Okay. All right, gentlemen, any questions or comments on the issue? <coughs> Mayor, please call the roll. Mayor, could I, could I say? Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Baldwin. One of their requirements, uh, this is probably a technical issue that can be worked around, is that the city waive all city and county property <coughs> taxes for the period of time that for all for the period of time that H and C holds the title. I'm not so sure the city can waive its own property taxes. I know it can't waive the county's property taxes. Uh, it, there's no reason the city can't pay itself its own taxes and also I guess pay the whatever part of the county taxes. Once the city gets it of course it'd be exempt. But for half the year there would be some taxes on this property. The county taxes last year were eighteen hundred and eighty two dollars. <coughs> so it, so we're not talking huge sums, but it's, uh, I don't think we can waive the taxes. Okay. So that's what we would likely be out We'd likely be, okay. be paying right. ourselves and also the county half of the, right. of the taxes. To ourselves would be wiped out when we're not, that's even, but the other would cost us $1,800. Right. Are you aware of that, Mr. Ellis? Explain again exactly what you said. They want to waive the taxes for the county and the city during the period of time that H and C holds title to the property. During the time, who owns property? Uh, Twenty. Hale Cotton. From from tonight to well, June thirtieth. From, from January the first until uh, June thirtieth. That's how the tax year would work. Whenever the deed's done, be from January the first until say if it's done in June, it would be roughly half the year. 
Why would you go? I mean, I'm just asking this question. Why do you go back to January 1st? That's where the tax year runs. It starts January 1 on all property taxes. And so then, it's really well, not free. Right. And then once the city acquires it, of course, it becomes exempt for the rest of the, from that po point forward. But, but there would be about half a year's taxes on it. We're, we're not taking it saying we're going to pay the county taxes, are we? Yes. That, that's, that's what I threw out there. I, I don't think we can waive the county taxes. And honestly, I'm not sure we can legally waive think you can. city taxes. <laughs> I think the city can pay itself city taxes and can pay the county taxes for half the year. You say the eighteen hundred dollars do that, that was county, county. would that, that was, be for half the year? No, that's that's the full year county that's taxes on the property. So it'll be okay. roughly nine hundred dollars for the county. Okay. And I'm not so sure we're what talking the city about nine hundred dollars net to it. All right, they are the facts, Mr. Nutting. Mayor, I wasn't really expecting the board to, to make a decision on this tonight. Uh, it would be great if we could make it by the April meeting. Uh, I don't think we're really hard pressed on this. I wanted to make sure if you had any extra questions, need any more research that we had some time to do that between now and the April meeting. If you want to make a decision tonight, that's fine. Mr. Mayor. All right, Mr. Hubbard. I don't think that $900 is too painful. How much the city taxes would be? They're doing? usually a little less than half of county or around half county yeah, taxes. Yeah, I, I, I didn't get so, the figure so for that. So we're talking about but, $1,200? Well, of course, the city would be paying yeah, itself. You'd be paying itself. So all you're talking about net cost to the city is, is reference to the county taxes. Well, Mr. Mayor, with a deal like this, could I just move and go on it? Haven't we, already, haven't we already voted to consider this? Yes, sir. I mean, have we, we have a motion in a second, correct? Yes, sir. All we have, yeah, uh, somebody wants to table it, you could do that. Otherwise, can I, Mayor, so, can I bring up one other thing? Yeah, you the, could bring the, up all the, kinds of problems. <laughs> well, I don't think this is also not a major problem. They're also wanting the city to pay all the uh, uh, fees related to the transfer of the property, uh, title insurance if necessary. I think we're talking about a thousand dollars roughly in that. <coughs> Area also. Well, maybe it might be wise to get a, a final total on that yeah, then before, before we vote, we vote on, on that. So, I someone about would suggest tabling that. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we table that. Yeah. Is there a second on the table? I second, I second it. Tabling. All right. It's you fine print. Do you favor tabling this motion? <clears throat> vote aye. When your name is called, you oppose vote no. Ellis. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Carneal. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass five to zero. All right. We move now to the top of the next page. Discuss and possibly take action on the summer concert series at J. Travis Price Park uh, for the coming fiscal year. You have the memorandum uh, explaining this. <coughs> Is there a motion and a second that this be considered? So moved. So moved. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask our illustrious Park and Recreation uh, Director to come to the podium and outline what you would like here. What you have a diversified concert, sir. Only if you'll sing. The purpose of this basically is if we wait to July 1 when the new budget goes into effect, it does not give us enough time to schedule bands, groups, entertainers to start performing in August. We have to start now. Last year we had them scheduled. Due to circumstances, we had to call off the concert series. I did not want to do that process again unless with this board's approval, basically I'm asking for an advance on next year's budget. You're of, going of how much? But the, the, the four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. That would cover four concerts. We are usually able to perform six with that kind of money, okay. through sponsorships and everything else. We can usually work out getting at least two more. Okay. Your goal is to use that where you go. If if approved, you would line these concerts up, hopefully to get six. Yes. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. Hearing done, you have what's before you, a request for $4,000.
for the uh, to be part of the fiscal uh, 2013 budget uh, to restore the summer concert series. If you favor this vote, aye. If you oppose, vote no. Carnell. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Mason. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Passed five to zero. All right. Now, 3.6 is discuss and possibly take action on the Public Works request to reallocate some funds in the street and drainage budget for the purchase of a rotary mower. Is there a motion? So, so moved. And a second. Second. Discussion now. Do you want to say anything? Well, I think I uh, covered that in the capital outlay, okay. just something that we need more at the okay. present time. That's instead of working on snow, we're going to work on mowing. Yes. I think that's probably more realistic for this year. <laughs> All right. Any questions before we vote? Hearing done, please call the roll. Hubbard. Aye. Carneal. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass five to zero. 3.7 is to discuss and possibly take action on, on amending the annual the contract for the city's annual audit with Thurman Campbell Group. You have a memo on that. Is there a motion this be considered? So moved. Have a second. Second. Okay. Paul, do you want to make any statement on that? Well, uh, I think uh, Jane uh, put it well. They they spent an awful lot of time on this last audit more than they expected. As a, and as the auditor stated in his presentation, that we do have some things that need to be worked on. Uh, I think Jane has a lot of confidence in their work. I have a lot of confidence in their work. I think it's a, a reasonable request. You, you want to retain an auditor for at least three years, and they've only been working two years and have done an excellent job. Well, the problem has to do with our, is it our software that needs to work? Well, that's one about? of the things okay. that need to be addressed. I assume, this, I assume this this was a a year-to-year -year contract even though we had a level price for, for three years we had received a three-year contract from Thurman Campbell so this would have been the third year it was an escalating they included it on an escalating basis so it was to be 40,000 for the, this audit year that we're in right now and they're just wanting to back out of that well, okay. What they basically what they have said is is because of the level of their they had a they had a forty seven thousand dollar loss on the job that they just got through doing. So what they would, if we are not able to increase the fee, if, if we don't approve that, then they would just walk away from the job for the third year. They would decline the third year of the contract. Do we not have any recourse there? I mean, I mean. If we walked away from the contract with them, they would certainly come after us, would they not? I, I, I don't think that we would. Jim, you may want to answer that. Uh, personal services contracts are generally the, the one performing the personal services can, can walk away and not get paid. Nice. Uh, personal services contracts are different than a lot of other contracts. So the net increase would be how much now? For this year, 10. 10,000. Okay. And that's what we're being asked to vote on? Yes, sir. <coughs> An increase of 10 from 40? From 40 to 50. 40 to 50. Okay. That's the motion that's before you. Mr. Ellis, you have a concern? Does anyone, I know we bid this and, and we ask the people to bid three year contract. Do you know who the second bidder was? I mean, and I, I'm sure we doubled this two, at least it was two years ago, I'm sure. But for them to bid and then come along and say, if you don't raise my bid, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm not, I don't know whether we do that or well, not. Well, we really, we didn't really handle this as a seal bid. It's professional services for specifically for audit, and that is covered by TCA. That is not, there is not a requirement there to actually take that out to bid. When they were awarded the business, Thurman Campbell was actually a takeover. They um, previously, um, Low Witherspoon had been the auditors for the city. They'd done it for three years. The Thurman Campbell acquired that firm. And so they did the job and we made the decision to stay with them. And their service has been tremendously improved over the three years that we had incurred with the predecessor auditor. 
Um, the issue is just for a lot of different reasons, one being that um, our speech really with our existing software, we're not able to provide statements in the required GASB format, and they are having to spend a lot of time actually doing that for us. And just the, the continuing environment and requirements, they're just having to spend an inordinate amount of time, and for them, that's right off of our services. All right, now this 40, the price that we're talking about going from 40 to 50,000, that's covering everything that we have, all of our utilities and everything, as well as the general fund. Yes. So that expense yes, is shared among water, water, wastewater, gas, electric, yes, and the general fund. Yes, Several businesses, if you will, are being on that. All right, let's put it in perspective. Now, any comments? First? Well, I, I think it's fair. Uh, before you explain that, you know, I was sort of looking at this kind of threatening you know, the firm has determined that they would prefer to decline the third year bid is rather than to incur the, the loss. But since you explained that they do do extra because of our need for update, is that the correct word to use? I think, I think it's fair. I think we need to be working on trying to upgrade some software. <laughs> Uh, all right, I think we've heard it discussed. If you express your feelings as you vote. Mason. Aye. Ellis. Ellis. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Carneal. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay. 3.8 <clears throat> is to discuss and possibly take action on the purchase of 40 tasers for the police department. This is going to be explained here in a few moments in a demonstration of video, I think, explain it. Um, is there a motion this be considered? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. I didn't mean by the demonstration that he's going to use the board here for <laughs> examples of it. <laughs> Uh, David Thompson, our police chief, will explain this. Should we come around? Are you going to make a yeah, verbal right. explanation first? Uh, yes, sir. I think I'll uh, give a verbal explanation first, and then we'll see if we can uh, get this running. Um, you've got a staff report on this, so you are aware that, as you know, in policing, we have people that sometimes resist the police, sometimes they try to hurt the police, sometimes they try to resist arrest, a whole variety of things. When that happens, the police have a lot of tools and, and gadgets that they can use to overcome that resistance. Uh, uh, the highest levels of resistance are things like using a firearm, using deadly force. At the lowest levels, it's just a, an officer's presence or voice or uh, they have other things, tools on their belts, things like uh, OC spray or gases, things of that nature, and then there are batons, things of that nature. One of the problems that we have with those things, however, is that they uh, all those tools are sort of limited as far as what they can do uh, and very often we have officers who are injured and sometimes we, we injure other people that are trying to resist the police. The tasers came out more than 10 years ago. They have refined these and updated these over the years. They've become more and more effective and, uh, and we believe that tasers are the most effective way to deal with those people who are resisting arrest and we're going to go through a little presentation show you what a taser is basically, how it operates, uh, let you ask questions. If you have questions, we've got a couple of uh, videos in there. We'll let you see some of those being used. Uh, I personally have experienced this. I've had a taser used on me before. I'll tell you it was the longest five seconds of my life. Uh, and I think you would find the same of the people in the police department that volunteered last week uh, to experience this for themselves. We have some video on those that we'll show you those too. So if we can do that, I'll also tell you that I've got a, a taser with me, and I will pass this around when we finish up with the video demonstration. I'll pass this around. It does not have any cartridges attached to it. Please don't push any buttons or switches on this, because if you were to do that, uh, that's, that's the electricity cycling. You could actually uh, zap yourself with about 50,000 volts of electricity, and you probably wouldn't like that. So, can we go on and do the uh, presentation? We'll step around where we can see it. I'm going to go to the 
which is, and we're looking at the latest and greatest upgrade to this. We don't want to buy it behind the technology world. The Taser is an electronic control device, has about a tenth of the peak current of a strong static shock. So if you think where it's like when you get zapped, it's about a tenth of that current when you're dealing with the joules of, uh, when dealing with amperage. However, voltage is much higher. Uh, the amperage, however, is that low, so that's why it's not dangerous a life-threatening to someone to receive a shock from this device. Why a taser? Well, one of the things that happens when there is resistance is when people are injured, they sue the city and they sue the police department and they always sue the chief. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want people injured. We don't want them suing the city. We don't want police officers injured. Uh, we have officers that have been injured. As a matter of fact, I'll give you some notes on those in just a minute. We don't want officers to be injured, so this is a win-win. It makes the public safer, it makes the police safer. As a matter of fact, I met with the uh, ACLU attorney that was handling the Cincinnati cases, uh, which was about five years of litigation. Asked him for his opinion about tasers. He said if he had his way, he would issue one to every law enforcement officer in America. Because it makes the officer safer, and it makes it safer for the public. How does the taser work? Well, basically, the body works uh, based on electricity. We have electricity that's going throughout the body. Uh, but this tells you a little bit about as the brain uses electrical impulses to stimulate nerves. That's how our body basically functions. We have literally billions of nerve impulses, electrical impulses taking place every minute, probably every second. If we can disrupt this neuromuscular control, then we can, uh, we can take somebody's ability away to resist and try to injure us. So what happens? When the taser works, it carries, actually fires out a couple of little cartridges, a couple of little uh, uh, leads, if you will, wire leads. Those actually hit the body, they hit the clothing, whatever, and it runs electricity between those two leads between those leads. It runs electricity that interrupts the electro uh, current that's taking place. It interrupts that. It does penetrate clothing. It will penetrate a bulletproof vest. Uh, I've seen it go through leather, motorcycle boots, and all kinds of other things. So it does penetrate clothing. And when, again, when it fires out, there's actually a little wire attached to this. It sticks, it almost looks like a little fish hook on the end of it. It sticks to the clothing, it sticks to the flesh, it sticks to whatever it hits, and then it runs the current between those wires, and runs those currents in the body, and that's how it basically interrupts the nerve impulses. It only runs on the voluntary muscles of the body. The voluntary muscles of the body have a very thin membrane that cover them. So it doesn't interrupt the heart. It doesn't interrupt things like that. Somebody with a pacemaker, that sort of thing, is not going to uh, to stop their heart from beating. This is on the involuntary muscles of the body, but it's very effective on those. Think of this sort of like a telephone conversation when you're talking on the phone, something interrupts it, you get some static or something, and then you reconnect, you, you get that, uh, you reestablish a connection, the same thing. It's not broken, there's no injury, <coughs> it just basically it disrupts that, that communication that's taking place. That's what we're doing, but we're doing it with the body instead of with the telephone. 
Where does this take us? It, uh, the X2 is a different type of technology. It's more effective than the old ones. I won't go through the details with you. But I will tell you that the old ones, if you didn't get the right connections, it may or may not be effective. Uh, with the new ones, it's more effective as far as uh, delivering the impulse, impulses and disrupting the, um, the communication slope. The goal is to impair ability, is not to inflict injury. It's not to try to inflict any kind of injury on anybody. The greatest danger of somebody with this is falling and hitting their head or, or something like that. Uh, that's why you'll see when we do some demos with police officers, we have people who are holding the officers on either side because when they fall, we don't want them to injure themselves. Other than that, it does not inflict any injury. Uh, just an example, Houston Police Department reduced their workers' com comp claims by 93% when they went to the taser. Now, some of you, that doesn't mean a whole lot to you in terms of dollars and cents, and what does that mean? 93% reduction in workers' comp claim is dramatic uh, for a, a police department. We've had people that have been injured in this department for a long, long time, going through various types of recovery. We pay out our own share of workers' comp. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, and again, Houston again talks about this. They take, they estimate that's an average of about $500 per officer per year that they have reduced uh, in their expenses. Department of Justice did an NIJ report, National Institute of Justice report. Uh, they basically said they believe that we've decreased injuries by about 60% by using, it's supposed to be ECDs, electronic control devices. That, uh, they feel that these agencies here, uh, these were 12 agencies that they looked at and reduced their claims by about 60%. Let's see, this is another uh, Reuters Health uh, talking about uh, uh, reduction of injuries and reduction of injuries to suspects. And I don't go through this quickly, but I figured that nobody's being tested on this tomorrow, so uh, I'm doing that sort of intentionally. Uh, Police Executive Research Forum 2009 study to the Institute of Justice found 70% fewer officer injuries and 40% fewer injuries to suspects. So again, these are, these are very significant numbers. Field proven results. We've got tasers in over 100 company, uh, countries, 16,000 agencies. There have been more than 300 medical studies. Tasers do not kill people. Just in case you happen to read the headlines 10 years ago or eight years ago or whatever on tasers killing people. Tasers do not kill people. I've talked to electrical engineers that this is not capable of, of uh, generating enough electricity to kill you. There's not enough amperage in this thing to kill a human being. Over 500,000 units have been deployed, 75,000 saves from serious death or injury. Uh, as far as how they came up with that number, uh, I will tell you that they're used repeatedly, people with knives, people who are mentally ill, <coughs> as well as people with guns, and use all different types of people. Uh, but they've been very effective. And look at the reductions of injuries here. You see, we're talking about with a firearm, you're talking about virtually out of a thousand, and this is number of injuries per thousand exposures, pretty much a thousand per <coughs> thousand, you get shot, you're injured. Uh, you see that a number, a, a large number of these are also fatalities. You look at baton strikes, and about 780 <coughs> out of a thousand people sustain injuries. Even a punch with a fist, about 780 out of a thousand sustain injuries. A kick, about 450, with less than half of that thousand sustain injuries. Playing basketball, about four out of a thousand sustain serious injuries. The taser, they've found that about two out of a thousand actually sustain serious injuries. And again, that keeps you from falling, falling on something. So with that in mind, we feel like this is something that's, that's fairly safe. If we didn't, we would not recommend it to you. Uh, a couple of things, some uh, uh, Springfield Police Department statistics. We looked at 2009, there were 41 use of force reports, three suspect injuries, and 19 of these would have been appropriate for taser usage. Some of these cases we use other things. We use gas or sprays or things like that, or batons or other types of things. 2010, we had 29 use of force reports, two suspects injury, injured and one officer injured. 18 of those taser would have been appropriate. 
2011, four suspect injuries, one officer injury, 19 of those a taser could have been used. In some cases, we're talking about presenting the, preventing the use of deadly force. Could have been prevented <coughs> if we'd had a taser instead. So with that, our workers comp claims, we looked at 2009 through 2011, about $30,000. I was talking with our assistant city manager earlier, and she was explaining to me this number is really low. Could you give us just a, a, a brief summary of that? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, the number is called. I looked it up just before I came downstairs. It's total work comp in those three years is 126,000. Is what the cost is. Now we've had some this year that are not included, which will put that way over. But um, definitely two of those, I'm sure, were cases that would, a uh, taser would have been appropriate. And those, you know, one of those was 57000 just by itself. So, I mean, our work comp claims are high. And we do have officers getting injured. And I'm just saying I think this is a great idea. So and this number, uh, this number is probably $100,000 below it, something like yes. that. Yes. Okay. With that, I do have a couple of videos here for you. Yes. Now, if you'd like to see some of Springfield's finest get paid, uh, we had a couple of instructors come in uh, this last week. They brought in tasers, and we had people that stepped up to the plate and said, I've got to know, I've got to see for myself. Uh, a lot of them did, including some of them that were with us this evening. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is not fun. Uh, I, I do want to point out that one of the, the first we're going to show is a female here. She actually did a lot of the homework on the research on all this. She helped prepare the, the, the PowerPoint to do all of that. She's away in school this week, and she wasn't able to be here. And I told her we could, we could wait if we had to, and she said no, that she, she believes in this enough that even if she's not here, she wouldn't want to proceed with it and do it anyway. So we'll show her first as far as her experience with the days. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. This is if you are supporting, please tell them if you are supporting and you do so, it's going to be okay. You will be fine. No, you will be fine. I don't care. 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 Right now. Uh, 
I think we've covered most of the, the major things as far as the advantages of these. They're very effective. They, uh, they do not cause any long-term injury. They reduce injuries <coughs> to the good guys and the bad guys and anywhere, everywhere in between. So we are uh, very much in favor of moving forward with this. As, I've, uh, as our staff report said, we have some drug forfeiture money that we can use for this. The significance of that is we're using money that we cannot use to lower somebody's water bill or their electric bill, or we can't hire more police officers or pay overtime or buy gasoline. This money is very limited according to state law. One of the things we can use this money for is purchasing tasers, and we're recommending that we utilize that funding uh, to purchase the tasers. We're talking about uh, purchasing 40 tasers for the police department. That way virtually every officer out here will be armed and trained with a taser. So, any questions? How much per taser? Approximately for the taser, cartridges, batteries, holster, the whole setup about $1,500 a piece. So about 60000 Yes, sir. And that would be paid for strictly out of drug money if we propose, if we approve this. Yes, sir. It would be strictly with drug money. There'd be no general fund money or, or other tax monies that would that would be utilized right, for Chief, that. Chief, thank you for your explanation of that and for the for the presentation. It was very thorough, thorough, and I don't think there's a doubting Thomas in the in the in the room because I, it, it certainly appears to be uh, effective. And if the injury rates, as you outlined, are what they are, and with the endorsement of everybody from ACLU to some other to people in insurance, uh, it sounds like it's a win-win. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, we have a motion, I believe, in a second. So move this be acted on. Uh, right, got the motion. Any questions now before or comments? Please call the roll. Carnell. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass five to zero. All right. Thank you. All right, 3.9 is a request from the <laughs> Life Center of Robertson County. That's, some people would know it as the former senior citizen center to hold a hot rod reunion and car show on the square on May 12th, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Carnell. Aye. Mason. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Pass five to zero. All right. Three point ten is an appointment to the beer board for Ward One. Who is the recommend? I'm, I'm recommending. Ms. Rosemary Yates, continuing in that position. Definitely. Okay. All right. No. 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 no she's not continuing. I'm replacing her. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, you've got Steve. Stephen Hyper. Hyper. Okay. I have one question. Is this Stephen Heber that lives on New Chapel Road? Yeah. See, I have. We we have those prerogatives. If if no one's going to volunteer in our ward, we've oh. always been able to go out to the other ward. So, okay. I think Miss Yates. Miss Yates was the first appointee when this new government changed, and she served us well. So I thank her for that. Okay. So. If it's approved, Stephen would take uh, uh, this Mr. 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 Heber actually lives in Ward 6. Yeah, he lives in Ward 6, but he agreed to... Uh, You'll loan him a, a member. <laughs> that's up to the individual, let's say, citizens. All right, uh, Steve he Heiber, or he Heber, Heber. Heber has been nominated for that uh, position. Are there any other nominations? That's the only one. All right. I'll ask the role I, be called. I do have one question. Yes. Is there any conflict there since his wife works for the city? She does not regulate beer. Mm -mm. Jane that's Murphy that's is the uh, is that's in the charge of that. The city recorder gets to regulate beverages. Would another one occur to you? In, in my appointment, I, I checked all the okay. areas. Very good. Yes. All right. If you favor this appointment, vote aye. If you oppose, vote no. Ellis. Aye. Hubbard. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Carnell. Aye. Mason, Aye. pass five to zero. All right, uh, 311 is to revisit the matter of the bulk waste collection. Uh, have we got a recommendation from staff on this? Alan, do you want to make that presentation? Uh, I'm going to, let's, first of all, let me get a motion here. Uh, Someone to be considered. Okay. Is there a second? 
Thank you. All right. Now, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Ellis. Okay. Uh, basically, we've rewritten the policy saying that we will have two cleanups a year, one in April and one in October, in which we'll go over the entire town picking up bulky waste at the same policies that we have now. We will have an area at the Public Works Department that's, that people can bring bulky waste if they would like to, or they can take it to the landfill. Uh, that would prohibit anyone on clean outs or where people have moved in and out. So I'm talking about landlords, things like that. But it would, any other person could bring it out there and dispose of it. Actually, a lot of people don't realize we've got that now. We just would have to do it in a little larger sequence. Of course, the whole goal is to remove the waste from the street. It's not a matter of money, because it'll probably cost about the same amount of money by the time the procedure goes along. But uh, basically, that's what we're recommending right now uh, at the present. All right, now brush collection remains the same. That's correct. And is your when is your uh, the date of the implementation of this? July 1. Okay. All right, you've heard the proposal. Now let's hear comments. We looked at a number of examples of where uh, cities in the mid-state uh, provide this service, and nobody really provided it to the extent that we that we did. Really. Most most people don't provide it at all, but the ones that do, like Greenbar, I give them an example. They have it once a year, but you bring it to them. To them, right. Very few actually pick up. I think Franklin picks up one day a week or something like that. And then a lot of them actually charge. Uh, we're, no one in the state does it the way we do. I know one in the local area around us. You've heard the proposal, Mr. Shoemaker. Uh, Alan, what are, is it the entire month of April and October, or two weeks, one week? We'll do the entire month, both. Okay. Now, it's going to be, y'all know, it's going to be very difficult trying to change over. And we're, we're going to try to advertise this as best we can and enforce it as best we can. But uh, uh, the whole goal is not any money savings, which I don't think there will be. The whole goal would be just to get it off the street. Well, we, we feel like that, that we, when we come by as often as we are, we're actually encouraging people to have this, this out there. It's well, I came by a street today and someone had taken their bed out there and just threw it off the, block, the yeah. bluff down to the road. It's and laying it's, out there right now. It's on so King's it's, Drive. We won't even be to that area until next month. On King's and Drive. Absolutely. So on And it's just unbelievable. Uh, other comments? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Ellis? So, so I've been concerned about this for a long time, especially since I left my house one day coming toward town. And uh, four or five doors for me, I had two commodes and some other things sitting on the sidewalk. <laughs> And I said, let's stop this. But, and then I began to think and to, and, and they are putting things out they shouldn't be putting out. They, we eventually come by and pick it up. But I'm afraid if we don't pick it up, it's going to be on Batson Boulevard, uh, out in New Cut Road. I mean, it's going to, they're going to haul it off and throw it out on the side of the road. Now that's my only concern, and, and I know we do more than most folks. And, and we're not talking about saving money. Uh, I just don't know how to, how to get it off the street. You know, I'm afraid if we don't have some kind of service, that's what they're gonna do with it. Well, you mentioned they might throw it out in certain places, but we've got, if we do in fact pass this, we you heard the explanation that we would provide an area at our public waste garage uh, where people can bring these items and they won't have to go out to the landfill. There'll be a, a location here in town and they could deposit things as, uh, uh, as an alternative to what we're presently doing. Paul? And also it's a $500 fine under state law. So you want to take your chances doing that, it's going to be very expensive for you. And there, there are ways of finding out who dumped it. Are there other uh, comments? Uh, Alan, it's a good proposal. You know, it just, I'm sorry like Miss Ellis, it's, 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 it's just a, it's a difficult thing to try to re-socialize people. 
I mean, because the right by those five mattresses that you see, you go up a, another 100 yards, what is about eight or nine big boxes, sitting on the opposite side. And this is, and this is gonna sit here for what, two weeks now? About two more weeks before we come through the area? Yeah, we split it up. Yeah. And, and it's just, it just, it's filthy. So, All right, you've had various ideas. I mean, we looked at a number of different options as we've talked about this uh, several times. Uh, you have the proposal before you, which would be implemented July 1st. Uh, anything further before we vote? Thanks, good plan. You favor these changes, vote aye. If you oppose, vote no. Carnell? Aye. Shoemaker? Aye. Mason? Aye. Ellis? No. Hubbard? Aye. Pass by. Pass four to one. All right. The consent portion of the agenda is before you now. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Mayor, there is uh, one item that we're not going to take any action on, and that's the asphalt crack sealant machine. I think we can take action on that possibly Tuesday at Tuesday's meeting. We should have a report at that so time. You're approving uh, items 4.1, 4.2, and 4.4 when you vote for this. There's no discussion on, on the consent docket once you voted to consider it. Uh, please call the roll. Hubbard. Aye. Carnell. Aye. Shoemaker. Aye. Ellis. Aye. Mason. Aye. Pass by two. Okay. Uh, I want to remind the uh, members of the board that we have the, an extra meeting coming up next uh, Tuesday night, the 27th at 7 p.m. And uh, remind uh, the public that uh, the opening day of baseball for Springfield will be Saturday, March 31st at noon at Travis Price Park. Uh, I think the gentleman by the name of David Thompson is going to throw out the first pitch. Uh, and uh, that's the gentleman that, that uh, just presented a, the taser proposal this evening. So uh, uh, I want to commend Parks and Recreation for the excellent job that they do with this program each year. It's well attended. Uh, kind of gets you in the, you know, in the mood for, for summer. And uh, since we know today's the first day of spring, uh, this is this is real appropriate to be kicking baseball off in such a fine man. Paul, what do you have? Well, thank you, Mayor. Just have a brief report this evening. First of all, I wanted to distribute to you right now a report on the hazardous materials at the Precision Products Building and uh, nothing that would cause us much concern the types of things you might expect. There is uh, some asbestos, some other hazardous materials that will have to be, uh, you know, part of the bid process when we go out there and, uh, and uh, renovate the building. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Ann Ellis of the Finance Department for coordinating the effort to clean and reorganize the records storage area at City Hall, which involved the removal of stored materials and outdated records and the installation of pallet racks for the current records and was assisted by Valerie Lane of the Finance Department and employees from Public Works, Fire, Gas, Water, Wastewater, Engineering and Finance Department, and I hope I didn't leave anybody out, who removed stored materials and old records, erected the pallet racks and installed wood shelving. The Fire Department B-Shift cut the lumber for the shelving and installed the shelving. And I'd like to recognize Mr. John Fike and Unarco for their corporate citizenship in generously donating five pallet racks of various sizes for the city's use. Uh, the greens at the Legacy were aerated yesterday and today, a month ahead of the usual time in mid-April, in order to make them ready for the new golf season. The Water Wastewater Department received notice today that the water system received a sanitary survey score of 95 which places it in the approved category of public order systems in Tennessee. And lastly, Codes Administrator Scott McDaniel resigned his position over a week ago to return to his hometown in South Carolina. We appreciate Scott's excellent work performance and his demonstrated professionalism during his tenure, and we wish him good luck in his future endeavors. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Anything further? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. I would like to spell a rumor that was brought to me today Someone's still going around saying that the green is unsafe. And two ladies confronted me this morning. So public from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon is one of the safest places in Springfield. <laughs> now after that, right, Mr. Phelps? 
We can recommend. We stand adjourned. Walk off the